started. Good morning. All right, we are, as I'm sure you know by now, because I say it every Sunday, in a series of lessons examining the law and faith. Where we are in this series, this morning is lesson six out of eight. Uh, we have looked at the what the Old Testament law is and what it is for, which for us today primarily is illumination. We wouldn't know what sin was if we if the law was not explaining it to us. And the books of the law were given to the people of the Exodus for many reasons. One, because of transgression. We heard that in Paul's letter to the Galatian churches. People didn't know when or where they were going against God's will for them, so he clamped it down for a period of time. And then two, uh, that law for those people set up the nation and prepared them for their new identity and obedience to God. It prepared them to be a nation which they had never been before. So a lot of laws about organizing and being good, good citizens to the community and to each other and formulating a military to be a defense against attackers who all around them were constantly coming in to try to stamp out this new nation of 600,000 people, but also to be offense, to take over the new land that God was leading them to. In fact, you'll probably remember from that first week, my categories uh, of the Old Testament laws, right? From those four books of the law, they were four categories, uh, authority, I put the Shema in the category of authority. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. There's others like that that fall into that category. Do not worship false foreign gods. Do not make allies with nations that, that worship other gods. Really, anything that would water down the pure direct placement of Yahweh as Lord of our lives, authority. Then the second category is moral laws, things like honor your father and mother, do not mistreat a foreigner, do not take advantage of a widow, do not spread false reports, and all the do not have sexual relations with, and then there's a list of different relatives and uh, types of relationships to not do that with. Third category was civil laws. Now we're getting into the territory of these are laws that specifically set up that nation of Israel and that nation's judicial system. Things like when to give restitution, if you borrowed something from someone and then broke it or lost it, when or how to charge interest, if you loan money, who you can and cannot loan money to, do not fail to report a sin or a crime if you witness it. In this category are all the laws about how the priests were to be organized and operate, the, the conduct of judges in the nation, what vows meant, uh, right? Laws concerning slaves, right? All of these, in my mind's eye, do not directly apply to us Gentile Christians. Those were for that nation specifically. We're not citizens of that nation. We are bound by the civil laws of our nation, you know? And then the fourth category was the ceremonial laws, setting up the temple, the sacrifices, which animals are clean for which offerings? If you can't afford an animal, what kinds of plant-based substitutes or bird-based substitutes were legal? What was ritual purity? The whole list of feasts and Sabbaths, okay? Also, for that time period, not because they were tied in a civil manner to that nation, but because those practices had to do with phase one of God's covenants with humanity. Once Jesus brought to completion phase one, and through his sacrifice brought us into phase two, we have a different perspective now. We no longer have a need to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're not directly that group who God let, led out of Egyptian slavery. That 
celebration of unleavened bread was for the Israelites to practice anamnesis, remember as if you were there, that frightening and incredible night when Israel's forefathers had to flee Egypt in the middle of the night. Remember that for generation after generation. That was the point for them. We're a different sort. We're adopted into the family. We're not Jews. So it is not required for us to remember as if we were there the Passover with the blood on the doors and having to leave so quickly in the middle of the night that there was no time for yeast. So all they had was unleavened bread. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with if we would like to celebrate those things, but we're not required to. All right. After looking at the Old Testament, then we looked at places in the Gospels where Jesus talked about the law and sometimes people's misuse of it. And then these last two weeks, we opened up Paul's letter to the Galatian churches, which is almost entirely about the law's uh, proper perspective given our living in phase two under the grace through faith. Because those people in the Galatian churches were dealing with a peer pressure situation where this group called the Judaizers came in saying that they represented the faith. They came straight from Jerusalem. They were people of James. Remember, they called themselves that to make you think that they were all legit, but they were preaching that you still need the yoke of the law around your neck. Jesus' sacrifice alone isn't enough. You have to obey the law too. That was their message. This morning, we're going to open up the next letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church community. Romans was written around three years after Galatians was written. And a big difference here is that Galatians, Paul was writing to people whom he had met in person and set up those churches in his first missionary journey. With Rome, Paul's never met these people yet. He's heard about the church in Rome, but he didn't get that one started. And not only has he not been there, but none of the apostles have visited there either. So there's this rogue church over in Rome. How that Roman church gets started? Well, it was started by Jews who were at that famous and amazing Pentecost. Yeah, what happened there? Jesus had ascended into heaven, promising the Holy Spirit, and then it's the festival of Pentecost. There's tons of people in Jerusalem for the festival, and around 120 of those are Christ's followers, and all of them saw this amazing thing, the sound like a huge wind, and then what looked like tongues of fire separated and rested on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. Okay, that is a wild and freaky thing. And there was a crowd who came up because they'd heard the noise and were amazed because Jesus' followers were speaking in tongues. What that meant was it meant all these people from all these different countries were there, and they spoke a bunch of different languages, and each of them were hearing what the disciples were saying in their own language. Like, that's wild. Acts 2, verse 9 through 11 lists people who were visiting Jerusalem from 15 different countries. One of those places, it says, were visitors from Rome. So that's who's here seeing this. And then Peter addressed the crowd and proceeded to preach the first Christian sermon, right? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So they're there. They hear the gospel. They respond and come to faith during that Pentecost, and then they go back home, and they took that good news back to Rome. So that's a good thing. The gospel was taken to hugely influential Rome by eyewitnesses who had seen the most incredible thing occur. Rome 
is so important in this time in history. Politically, if you've got Rome in your corner, even though it's a tough pill for the Jews of Israel to swallow, right, because they feel they should be an autonomous nation under God, and what's with all these exorbitant taxes that I got to pay to this other nation, but some of them know you get in politically with Rome, you will have the might of the empire on your side. Paul was a Roman citizen because his parents were Roman citizens and he had been born in Tarsus, which was a Roman province, which meant that Paul had a bunch of rights that typical non-Roman Jews did not. Okay, combine that with the fact that Paul had the privilege to have studied under the, the Jewish law under Gamaliel, who was considered one of the greatest teachers of the time. Not just anyone got to study under Gamaliel, but Paul's parents had clout and got him in. So Paul was considered to be 100% Israelite. He came from the tribe of Benjamin, he says in his letters. He studied under the most prestigious Jewish law teacher of the day. He was a Pharisee. No wonder he refers to himself in Philippians as a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now there's a church going in Rome. None of the apostles have been there. Paul has not been there. And so this is a timely letter to that Roman church with important stuff that Paul felt needed to be communicated with them. Now, I'm planning to spend two weeks on Romans, this week and next week, looking at passages in Romans that deal directly with the law and its relationship with us. In Galatians, we were able to go through the whole book. It's only six chapters, and they're pretty short, relatively speaking. Also, Galatians is almost completely focused on this topic. Romans is 16 chapters, so we're not going to look at every word, right? Every page of Romans. That's a different kind of study that we should do. This is more of a bus ride, okay? We're going to stop at places that are relevant to our study in God's law and then get back on the bus and go past a bunch of stuff to the next stop, all right? Okay, here we go. Paul writes to the Roman church. He begins in chapter 1 by announcing who he is, a servant of Christ Jesus, an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, and then he can't wait to meet him. And then the very next thing is he presents the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, in history, he means, in the past, and also now to the Greek. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, or in other words, beginning and ending with faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We've unpacked that saying in Galatians, yeah? The original quote that he's quoting is from the prophet Habakkuk. Paul, Paul also quoted this scripture in Galatians, making his case that faith, which is not only believing, but also doing, is what saves you. The righteous shall live by faith. But what's the other side? What about the unrighteous? Verse 18, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Who's he talking about here? Anyone who tries to tell you that God is not the one and only God, or that God does not exist, or that Christ is not his only begotten Son, or we're about to see in a couple more verses, Anyone who maybe believes in God, but does not place him in the proper placement of Lord over their lives. He goes on to say, verse 19, For what can be known about God is plain to them, 
because God has shown it to them. For God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to them. See, this is interesting because at least some of who he's talking about are people who are like, yeah, I know God exists and all, but I'm not going to obey him. I'm not going to walk a path. I got other stuff to do, right? They didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Verse 24, he says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because... They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So that's the first thing. God's wrath is against those who insist on going their own way, doing it their way and not the way God told them to. Sorry, Frank Sinatra. You did it your way. If it wasn't God's way, then that he laid out for you, the path, God will just give you over to your own thing. All right? Moving on, chapter 2, starting in verse 12, Paul says some things that are very reminiscent of what we saw in his letter to the Galatians. He says this, if a person sinned and they didn't know the law, they didn't know the law. Well, they perished. They just perished without the law. And everyone who does know the law and sins are judged by the law. So it's a double-edged sword. You didn't know the law. You just perished because you didn't have the pathway to God. You did know the law and you broke it. Judgment. That's life under the law. Oh, and also he goes on hypocrite, right? Because he's like, did you teach about stealing, but then stole stuff yourself? Did you teach against adultery, but then committed adultery? Yeah, good job, dude. Plank out of your own eye, you know what I mean? He gets into the discussion about how the law is all or nothing, which we've seen before. We unpack that in Galatians. He says this in verse 25, For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. You broke the law. You broke the covenant with God. God made the covenant with Abraham. God kept up his side of the agreement. And man sealed that agreement with circumcision. And man broke that agreement when he commits sin. That's what he means. Circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Here's a key part, a key of this part. Paul says this, just like he said in Galatians, verse 28, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circ circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. We've encountered this a couple of times in our study here. Paul is like, for generations... God's people have all been thinking that it's all outward. You do, you don't do, and you prove your commitment with this circumcision thing, but whatever's in your mind and what's ever in your heart, that's a private thing. Nobody knows what's going on in that mind of yours. Well, it turns out somebody does know. It's not about trying to impress others with your Jesus face that you put on Sunday mornings. It's not about how you present yourself to others and puff up and look all pious. It's about what's in your heart and what God sees. Oh, and by the way, that's not new with the whole New Testament thing either. God always said, it's about your heart. 
Deuteronomy 10.16 said, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. We talked about that before, I think in week one, when we were un unpacking the Old Testament. You cannot fool God and just act a certain way and hope he's not looking in your heart. He's looking in your heart. All right, over to chapter 3, verse 9. Paul explains that no one is righteous. Jews, Gentiles, we're all in the same sin bucket. And he quotes Psalm 14, none is, right, none is righteous, no, not one. But we've heard before that God counts faith as righteousness, the whole Abraham story, right? God counted Abraham's faith as righteousness. What are you talking about? No one is righteous, no, not one. All right, well, that's pretty simple, right? He's about to talk about the righteousness of God through faith. This right here is setting up the baseline that us, on our own, on our own account, it is not possible for us to be righteous by God's standard, by holiness standard. Our starting point as human beings is desperate need of God. Verse 19, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We've seen that before in this study. A lot of repetition here, which is good. The law does not redeem anyone. It does not justify anyone. What was the primary purpose of the law? To give you the knowledge of what sin is, what holiness is. What you do with that knowledge, it's entirely up to you. He says the law and the prophets all bear witness to the fact that the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. All right, bunch of things were just said there, and I'm going to go through each one of them. But before I go any further, I just read a fancy five-syllable word. God put Christ forward as a propitiation. This is an interesting word for a couple of reasons, and I'll tell you why. First of all, the Greek word... Hilasterion means a sin offering. The NIV uses the word atonement, which we're probably more used to hearing, right? And it's easier to say. <laughs> but the more interesting thing to me about how he used this word specifically was because Hilasterion, this Greek word, was the word that they used in the Septuagint right, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, for the mercy seat. You all know what that is, right? The covering on the ark. It was where Israel's sins were atoned every year on the Day of Atonement. He just used a specific word to let everyone know Jesus is that atonement now used to be the mercy seat on the ark. Now it's Jesus. I find that interesting. Okay, what else did it say in that one sentence? <laughs> Let's break it down. First of all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Second, we are justified by his grace as a gift. You have to pay to receive a gift. No, gifts are given free of charge. What do you do when you receive a gift? You open it and enjoy it. Or you can return it. Some people do that. Don't do that with this gift. Third, how did it happen? By Jesus being the atonement, the propitiation. He, he's what 
we used to think of as the mercy seat. Jesus is that atonement now. And lastly, in this, in this sentence number four, how do we receive that gift? It's said to be received by faith, which is not just believing. Yeah? Faith is a noun, meaning you believe without a shadow of a doubt, and it is a verb, trust. Walk God's path he's laid out for you, also without a shadow of a doubt. He says in verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. What's he saying? If you were saved by keeping the law, then you would be able to boast. You'd be able to brag about how well you were doing, which is what the scribes and Pharisees were trying to do. Yeah? Good thing that's changed today. Nobody brags about how righteous they are, do they? You have nothing to brag about because there is nothing that you can do to earn the salvation of God. He gave it, period. And your faith in him is you receiving that gift. Here we go, verse 29. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. There you go. Here's the new world, folks. God justifies everyone by faith. Salvation is not exclusive to any one group. No one has the exclusive rights to God. And here's a key question, verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Is it nullified? Is it done? Is the Old Testament only? Throw out the law because it's done. He says, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Does faith wipe out the law? Does it, does it cancel out all the Old Testament scripture? Not at all, is what Paul said. When we comprehend the way of salvation through faith, we understand the connection between the Old and New Testaments. We read the Old Testament, we understand why Abraham was chosen, why the law was given, and why God worked patiently with the children of Israel throughout the Old Testament. Faith does not wipe out the Old Testament. Rather, it makes God's dealings with the Jewish people understandable and underscores our life today. The gospel does not contradict the law. But now with the gospel, we have a view of the law that most people during the first covenant did not have. The law was never meant, was never designed to be a means of salvation. It was a temporary clampdown to inform, to illuminate, and the sacrificial system covered over sins. But the salvation that it foretold is through Jesus and is available through all through faith in Jesus. Christ did not nullify the law. He fulfilled it. Here, here's a way to think about this. And I, I, think, I think we may have talked about this before. So it may be re repeat, I can't remember. But think about it this way. There were lots of prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah, yeah? When Jesus was born and then baptized and then began his ministry and established the church and died and rose again and ascended and brought about the Holy Spirit into the world, in other words, the gospel, the gospel did not nullify all those prophecies. Know what I mean? In fact, I would say that the gospel enhanced those prophecies. When Isaiah prophesied, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, and then that actually happened? That got fulfilled? It did not nullify the prophecy. In fact, it enhanced it. Suddenly made it very, very real and made it more relevant to those people. I think it's the same with Christ being the atonement for our sins. It says he came to fulfill the law. And in the Greek, it's the same word that's used for 
fulfilling prophecies. The law was designed to lead to the gospel, to foretell it, to, to tell us that it's coming, to usher in that second phase. And the gospel fulfills that law. The law told about the coming covenant through the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled it. And now we Gentile Christians don't obey the law out of obligation, but we follow the law out of gratitude for our gracious and saving Father. All right? Chapter 4. This is fast, isn't it? (laughs) Fast as I've ever been through Romans. Chapter 4, Paul expands on the Abraham story and uses Abraham as the example of someone who lived by faith. Paul is saying that the law is not unimportant, but that it is impossible to be saved just by obeying it. Paul's like, faith is it, guys. It's always been faith. He says this, let me ask you, when did God count Abram's faith as righteous? Righteousness, I should say. Was it before or after he was circumcised? Right, it was, it was before. God counted Abram's faith as righteous before he gave him the new covenant and, command, and commandment of circumcision. Paul's saying that the ritual of circumcision did not earn for Abraham his acceptance by God. Abraham found favor with God by faith alone. And then he entered into the covenant with God through, through circumcision. I'm going to skip through a lot of chapter 4. A lot of it we already covered in Galatians. Just know that the whole purpose of this chapter is Paul saying Abraham was counted as righteous for his faith, and there wasn't even any law yet. You kidding me? The, the law wasn't even given to Moses until 600 years after all this Abraham stuff, right? That's, that's everything that he's making point there in chapter four. All right, chapter five, he starts off by saying, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just take a moment to reflect on that sentence. We have peace through God, with God through Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, that, that gives me comfort. Verse 2, through him, Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All right, I have a question here. Anybody here following along in a version that is not the ESV? Ah. Okay. Okay. When I just read from verse 2, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What does your version say? We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, I had to stop here in my study because I was like, wait a minute, rejoice and boast. What do these words have in common? What, What do they have to do with each other? They seem different to me. In fact, I thought boasting was bad. Yeah? This is why studying with different versions and a concordance is such a tremendous tool. Okay, this word, this Greek word, where it's rejoice in ESV and boast in other translations, is unpronounceable. I'm not going to try. But the meaning of it is to hold your head up high, confident. I am glorifying the Lord because I know without any shadow of a doubt that he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So, one thing. I thought that we had just heard Paul say, what becomes of our boasting, it's excluded. You have nothing to boast about. Ah, That's pretty simple, actually. (laughs) You've got nothing about yourself to boast about, yeah? But the Lord of Lords, that's who we boast about. In fact, we sing it in one of our songs in worship. Glorify the Lord with me, says, my soul will boast in the Lord of all lords. And you all know that song is a direct quote of a psalm, right? Psalm 34, 
That whole song is Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord of all lords. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Direct quote of Psalm 34. Now, I find it fascinating that this use of the word boast is synonymous with the word rejoice. How are rejoicing and boasting the same thing? What, is, what does rejoice mean to you? Excited, positive, a joyous outpouring, celebration of our God? I think they are related. Yeah? What are we rejoicing? We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We're on the winning side. So it's, it's like our group is on this hill, right, with the glory of God with us, and the ungodly, the other group, are on another place, and we're on the winning side, and we're all like, yeah, in your face, right? <laughs> Maybe that's the feeling here. It says we rejoice or boast in hope of the glory of God. And verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, hmm knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, we, we not only rejoice in that guaranteed future glory, but we rejoice now even when things are not going well for us all the time. Yeah? Now, we don't rejoice because of our sufferings. What did it say? We can rejoice in them or through them. A lot of us don't like to hear suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. A lot of us would go, well, I just as soon not have the character then. Thank you very much. Most of us don't look forward to being sharpened by the iron. But when you've gone through something and you've come out the other side and you look back and you realize that God was there the whole time, sometimes it didn't feel like it during the time. But when we go through stuff, we know that we are not alone and lean on God for our strength. God's love has been poured out on us through the Holy Spirit. He will give you the strength to endure. Okay. The rest of this passage and of this chapter is really focusing in on the gospel message. While we were still weak, we were still sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. We've received reconciliation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the discussion of how sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and that's how sin spread to all humans. This is all great stuff, worthy of a deep dive in Romans, but we're going to skip past the rest of chapter 5, except go with me to verse 18. He says, Adam's one trespass led to the condemnation of all, and Jesus' act of redemption leads to the justification in life for all. Verse 20, for the law came in to increase the trespass. Okay, hold up here. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase? God wanted sinfulness to increase? Is that what it said? Of course not. God wanted everyone to know what they were doing. Here's an example. Little toddler keeps calling strangers at Walmart idiots. He doesn't know it's a bad word. He just heard his dad say it a bunch of times while driving, right? Mom goes to the kid and says, we don't call people that, Billy. That's a bad thing to say to people. You don't call people idiots. Now the child knows that that's a no-no. That's a rule. Okay. We don't call people idiots. And boy, does dad have some explaining to do, right? So the sin didn't increase. Sin was already always there. Our knowledge 
of what we were doing and unwittingly doing a lot of times increased. He says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now you see just how massive the world's sin was. Now you can see just how huge God's grace was to purchase all that and get your sin forgiven. This was no small price, guys. Now you see the vastness of God's grace here. It is of tremendous value. As much as sin in death, as much as sin reigned in death, grace had to reign to pay for it all. Okay. Turn the page, Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 1, Paul continues this thought process. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Sometimes I wonder if Paul was a closet lawyer, the way he puts things, right? Bible says he was a tent maker, but I don't know. Kind of sounds like Matlock sometimes, right? He's like, so if more sin means more grace, then what do you think? We should sin more, get more of God's grace, yeah? (laughs) By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? You got removed from the mud. Why do you still want to live in it? And so Paul says this, verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is such a beautiful application of us being buried and then risen again along with Christ. Is it not? We must walk. That word in the Greek is peripateo. I know I've talked about that in previous classes, not this series yet, but um, I, I always remember that Greek word. Walk means how I conduct my life. What is my day to day? There's a great saying that I've heard before that says, Anyone can say that they care, but watch their actions, not their words. That is a truism for us, people to people, and it is a truism of our relationship with God. If I go to prayer and I say, God, you are Lord of my life. Thank you for your blessings. My life is in you. But then I ignore him the rest of the day? Who am I trying to kid? I mean, God's not falling for it. There's a verse in Titus, Titus 1, verse 16. Paul's talking about people whose minds and consciences are corrupted, and he says, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. May or may not directly mean what I was talking about. We must walk, peripateo, that Greek word, every day, day in and day out. Walk in newness of life. Habitual sinning and the Holy Spirit are not compatible. And when you try to walk in both worlds, you think you're keeping some neat balance because between your sins and God, it's it's causing a rift in your relationship with Christ. Your old self was sacrificed, was crucified with Christ. You used to be a slave to sin. When you died with Christ, you were liberated from that. Paul calls it a slave master, an evil slave master. We have new life in Christ. We are the bride of Christ, are we not? As the church, the bridegroom has lovingly and sacrificially chosen the church to be his bride. And we're in the betrothed period right now. Our responsibility to Christ our groom is to remain faithful to him. Yeah? Verse 12, he says, let, us, let, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Dead to sin, alive to God. 
When sin offers us something tempting, we should answer, no, that's the old way, and I'm, I'm dead to that. That is not the kind of life that I want for myself. If we believe we will, we will live with Christ in the future, we should also believe that he has overcome the power of sin and death, and he liberates us from those powers in this life. Is it? possible for us to stop all sinning? I don't think it is. But I think if our attitudes are like what Paul has said, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't want to, I don't do what I want to. If we're thinking, I hate that I miss the mark here and here, but I keep talking about this with God because he can help me build up an ability to look to him and not to it. That's how we're not slaves to sin. This is not automatic or else Paul wouldn't be telling us about it, right? We have to remind ourselves of who we are, children of the Savior, not children of the sinner. Just as Christ died to sin, we should resist sin as much as we can, day by day. This is the new life we are to live. But the Christian life is not just about refusing sin, right? We are supposed to be alive, alive to God, because we are in Christ Jesus. Our desire to live for him should be very much alive. And that's what the rest of this passage, this chapter is saying. It's not about turning away from something. You turn to God. And so present your members, Paul says. In other words, give your body to God as a vessel of righteousness. We shouldn't let sin use our body parts as tools that make us more wicked, but let God use our bodies as tools of righteousness, as people who work for his kingdom. Amen. Let us be slaves to righteousness. We were buried with him. We were with him in newness of life. That's how we live our lives, basking in the glory of our Lord. Amen? All right, next week we will pick up on the second half of Romans. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, teach us, O Lord, from your book of the law, Open our eyes to see you for who you are and not who we think you should be. Father, clear our minds of any preconceived notions that we have about our daily walk with you and grow our focus in you. In everything that we do or say, may we always look at you first. Just like a little child looks at its mom first if a stranger asks a question to see if it's all right to talk to that person let us get all of our instruction and guidance from you all day every day in jesus name we pray amen